Welcome back designers. Today we're going to talk about color and to help us with our talk about color we have a little friend from YouTube. Color. It plays a vital role in design and everyday life. It can draw your eye to an image, evoke a certain mood or emotion, even communicate something important without using words at all. So how do we know which colors look good together and which ones don't? The answer is simple. Color theory. Artists and designers have followed color theory for centuries, but anyone can learn more about it. It can help you feel confident in many different situations, whether it's choosing colors for a design or putting together the perfect outfit. All it takes is a little insight and you'll be looking at color in a whole new way. Let's start at the beginning, the very beginning, with a refresher on the basics. Remember learning about primary and secondary colors in school? Then you already have some knowledge of color theory. Red and yellow make orange, yellow and blue make green, and blue and red make purple. If we mix these colors together, we get even more in-between shades, like red-orange and yellow-green. All together, they form what's called a color wheel. You can probably see where it gets its name. Now, let's take it one step further with hue, saturation, and value. These are terms you might never see in daily life, but they're the key to understanding more nuanced colors, like all those little paint chips at the home improvement store. Hue is the easiest one. It's basically just another word for color. Saturation refers to intensity. In other words, whether the color appears more subtle or more vibrant. Value has to do with how dark or light the color is, ranging from black to white. As you can see, this gives us many different shades, from a deep reddish brown to light pastel pink. So how do we put this all together to create professional-looking color schemes? There are actually tried-and-true formulas based on something called color harmony that can help. All you need is the color wheel. The easiest formula for harmony is monochromatic because it only uses one color or hue. Just pick a spot on the color wheel and use your knowledge of saturation and value to create variations. The best thing about monochromatic color schemes is that they're guaranteed to match. An analogous color scheme uses colors that are next to each other on the wheel, like reds and oranges, or cooler colors like blues and greens. Don't be afraid to play with the palette and create your own unique interpretation. That's what these formulas really are, merely starting points to help guide and inspire you. Complementary colors are opposite each other on the wheel, for instance, blue and orange, or the classic red and green. To avoid complementary color schemes that are too simplistic, add some variety by introducing lighter, darker, or desaturated tones. A split complementary color scheme uses the colors on either side of the complement. This gives you the same level of contrast, but more colors to work with and potentially more interesting results. A triadic color scheme uses three colors that are evenly spaced, forming a perfect triangle on the wheel. These combinations tend to be pretty striking, especially with primary or secondary colors, so be mindful when using them in your work. Tetradic color schemes form a rectangle on the wheel, using not one, but two complementary color pairs. This formula works best if you let one color dominate while the others serve as an accent. There are a few classic do's and don'ts when it comes to color. For instance, have you ever seen colors that seem to vibrate when they're placed next to each other? The solution is to tone it down, literally, and there's a simple way to do it. Start with one color and try adjusting its lightness, darkness, or saturation. Sometimes, a little contrast is all your color palette needs. Readability is an important factor in any design. Your color should be legible, engaging, and easy on the eyes. Sometimes that means not using color, at least not in every little detail. 
Neutral colors like black, white, and gray can help you balance your design. So when you do use color, it really stands out. Every color sends a message. It's important to consider the tone of your project and choose a color palette that fits. For example, bright colors tend to have a fun or modern vibe. Desaturated colors often appear more businesslike. Sometimes it just depends on the context. You'd be surprised how flexible color can be. You can find ideas for color schemes in all kinds of interesting places, from advertising and branding to famous works of art. You can even use a web resource to browse color palettes or generate your own. Even experienced designers take inspiration from the world around them. There's nothing wrong with finding something you like and making it your own. Everywhere you look, there's color, color, and more color. It can be intimidating to use it in your work, but it doesn't have to be. Just keep experimenting. All right, how about that? I thought that was a good, um, so what I'm looking for, um, not relevant, uh, brisk practical, practical approach to color rather than be too uh, intellectual, too heady about it. Um, although I will get a little heady kind of going through a um, little more of the details of color. So I'm going to continue with talking about basic color theory. Uh, basic color theory was invented by none other than Sir Isaac Newton. Yes, he of the invention of gravity or the discovery of gra gravity. Uh, so he did so in 1665. And through experimentation, he discovered that white light passing through a glass prism could be separated into all the colors of the spectrum. So basically, if you've ever done that, you've seen a light shine through a prism and it makes a rainbow on the wall. That's pretty much what he discovered. Uh, the discovery, of course, as you might imagine, goes into much more depth than that. But that's all you really need to know for um, our purposes. All right, so this is a color wheel. Uh, Isaac Newton created the first color wheel. This is, of course, a modern adaptation of that, but it's the same basic principle. Um, as you saw in the video, artists use a color wheel to describe the relationship amongst colors. And I'm just putting some words to the things that the um, person talked about in the video. Um, these are the primary colors. She talked about them, but she didn't name them, so I just want to make sure you have the names. For them. So the primary colors are the colors um, that are the originals, the parent colors, if you will. You can't really get to them by mixing any other colors. Whereas the secondary colors are a result of mixing two different primary colors. So if we go back, you see if you mixed the red and the yellow, you're going to get the orange there, and so on, so on and so forth around the color wheel. Now the tertiary colors are if you mix a primary with a secondary, you get a tertiary. So anyhow, there are relationships between colors. Um, the relationships, rather, are dictated by where they fall on the color wheel. This was mentioned in the video, but we'll go through it quickly. Uh, if we use one color from the color wheel, what do we call that? Anybody? 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 Monochromatic, you're right. You're all correct. If you use one color in design, any of the colors, um, it's called a monochromatic design. You can see this design here is made up of various uh, values and saturation levels of the same color red. So that was a monochromatic design. What about this one? If you were thinking analogous, you would be correct. Give yourselves all stars, analogous colors. Um, they're close together on the color wheel and using them together provides a minimal color contrast. And because of that, there is an innate harmony between the colors. Uh, and that's because they share elements in common. They're all sort of in the same um, geographic region, so to speak. And yeah, we'll move on to uh, an example. This is a wider analogous because it takes in, um, it adds the yellow in there. And I, I tried to block off the little color wheel on the right to show you um, where it all falls. But the yellow really is used as a backdrop element um, to really make the other ones pop. So it's almost used independently. Now, um, 
this is this is almost monochromatic. I don't, actually don't even think it's using the three colors I'm, I'm showing on there. I think it's even more narrow. But when there is a narrow range of values, we call it a low contrast design. Um, and it is used to evoke a different emotional response from a viewer than um, if we use a lot of contrast. And I'll show you an example of that in a second. This is a low contrast and a, um, and a narrow range of values. On the other hand, here is an example that has a wider range. Um, this is almost analogous. I think it goes a little bit far between the green. It actually does have the complementary colors, the um, red and green, or almost a full red and green. So it's borderline. So it really has that more pop than something like that's going to have. But you get different feeling. There's much, there's much more drama to this as opposed to the kind of harmonious sort of feel of this. And that's what I want you to get more than anything. When you're working on your designs, you want to be able to capture the feeling. Like if you're doing a design for a um, pediatric company, you might not want to use these deep contrasting colors um, because they're just a little bit uh, aggressive or they don't quite fit um, the feel that you're going for. We'll talk more about that later. Now, what do we call these? First of all, we're looking at the opposites, the red and the green. And if you said complementary colors, you would again be correct. Uh, if we skew off to the left there, it's a near opposite. Um, that's just you know one off from the complementary color. And complementary colors are colors that have no element of one another, as opposed to the analogous, where they're sort of in the same region. Uh, you could use the term, where did I put that? Um, you probably heard the phrase, people are on, quote, opposite sides of the spectrum, end quote. That's where that expression comes from. These colors are on opposite side of the spectrum. They have nothing in common. And the one thing I did not mention earlier was colors are usually grouped into color temperatures, and they're either cool or they're warm. And I think most of you probably know this. That's one of the reasons I skipped it. But for those of you who don't, the, the reds, um, orange, yellows are the warm colors and the others are considered cool colors. And the ones that kind of are in transition are in transition. So sometimes the green can be cool, sometimes the green can be warm. Okay. Okay, so here's an example of using complementary colors in a design. I mean, they literally use this, the color, to cut the design in half. Um, they're going for as much visual drama as they want. This is an example of, you know, you would not use this for a pediatric uh, nurse's company. You would use this for a dramatic movie poster where you're trying to get people's attention. There's a visual tension about using these colors together. It's another example. It really pops off the page. She talked about this as well. Be careful putting complementary colors on top of each other. I'm not sure what language this is in because I just realized that that's not spelled correctly. Um, I'm going to pretend it's another language that spells hello with one L. But when you lay them on top of each other, you often get, and I think the red and the cyan on the far left gives you the clearest um, example of the, um, the kind of... Um, um, my God, vibrating, couldn't think of the word, say rotating, the kind of vibrating feel that you get on those edges and it kind of creates that dark mark around it and just doesn't look very good. You can kind of, I'm like moving my head on looking at the screen and it's kind of, it's kind of changing, it's, it's kind of funky. So the way we avoid that is uh, a split complement and that's very much the same as using near opposites as you see up there in the right hand corner. It's the same idea as rather than going directly across the color wheel, you go directly and then off to the side and you can see, even see, on my dark green and red, how you see that, that funky dark line, that's where they, where they touch. You don't see that in the lighter green. So that's a way to use complementary colors, but skew them just a little to get away with it. It's another example, split complement. A, a pure complementary color is orange to blue, but we do orange to this more violet color, um, and it gets away from some of that vibration, although that vibration is not quite as bad as that vibration. All right, color systems or color modes are an important thing for a designer. You've probably seen this in your work in Photoshop. Um, you've probably heard of RGB and CMYK, and those are important things to know. Uh, we're going to get into that 
uh, now, and I think there is another video. Oh my gosh, there is. Now, this guy is a little bit crazy, but he's pretty clear and to the point, and I think um, that's what counts at this point. So, without further ado... Hello and welcome to 2 Minute Design. I'm Dage, and today we're gonna understand the difference between RGB and CMYK. How many colors does your printer use to print a full colored image? Four, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Thus, the CMYK color model. In fact, this inkjet printer works just like a painter. To create a colorful painting, the artist can use just three primary colors, cyan, magenta, and yellow. If he wants to print green, for example, he can simply mix cyan and yellow. Every time the painter adds a color to an area on his painting, that area will be darker. That's why this is called a subtractive color model. Now if he combines all three colors, the result will be an imperfect black. So he prefers to add perfect black paint to his palette. Now what about the RGB color model? RGB is red, green, and blue, the primary colors of light. This is darkness. This is a red spotlight, a green spotlight, and a blue spotlight. When the three spotlights overlap, the light becomes white. In fact, whenever you add a color, the light becomes brighter. That's why this is called an additive color model. So to create a colorful image using light, we need to use red, green, and blue lights. But if printers use ink to create pictures, why do we need light? Have you ever ran out of television ink? No! That's because TVs use light to create colorful images, not ink or paint. What about your computer's monitor? Your mobile phone's screen? The beautiful sun! They all emit light to produce colors using the RGB color model. In fact, if it weren't for the RGB, you wouldn't be able to even see the CMYK. There wouldn't be any light to even see anything at all! <laughs> so, in summary, thanks to RGB we can see things, and thanks to CMYK we can print them out. And thank you very much, man from YouTube, who will win no Oscars for that performance. Um, okay, so how do we see color? The only way we see color is through light. So um, the color we see is the color that is reflected off of the object. Um, so the color we see on the surfaces of objects in our environment are perceived and known as reflected color or reflected light. So that when the light strikes the object, in this case a um, ladybug that we perceive as red, some of the light is absorbed. And what light is absorbed is all the colors that are not red. So anything that's not red in the spectrum is absorbed into the ladybug and the red is reflected off. So that's why we call it reflected light. Um, the unabsorbed light, the red, is what is reflected and that's what we see. That's probably about as scientific as we're going to get. And so we will end on this beautiful picture uh, of a ladybug. And just in case you didn't know what a ladybug was, here's a picture of one. And one last point. Following along the same idea of reflected light, uh, the leaf, in this case, is absorbing all the colors of the spectrum except for the green. That's why we see the green. Um, I think of it like a rubber ball, like you, you throw the ball and it, it hits the ground and the, the green hits the ground and pops up to our eye and all the other balls kind of go right into the floor. The, all the other color balls kind of get stuck on the floor, whereas the green bounces off. Um, <laughs> and hits us right in the eye. Maybe that's not the best analogy. Um, anyhow, I should shut up now. Um, I will talk at you all soon. Bye.